talked a lot about expression so far, DNA being transcribed into mRNA, translated into protein. And so we have to kind of revisit that, that expression process, but also the process of replication. And so we're just going to get kind of the generalities about the nucleic acids first. And we're not really going to delve very heavily into the genetics of all of it, but more of the molecular side. So for our nucleic acids, once again, these are polymers like all the other things we've been talking about. Is there a blessing going on? <laughs> I never know why people bless someone else that sees It's because back in the olden day, it, they thought that your soul was in. You should be saying, <laughs> stop it. You're be sick. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be nice to people sneezing. I'm just kidding. But yeah, they thought you lost your soul, so you, yeah. you blessed the part of your soul you lost every time. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit crazy, isn't it? Yeah. But who knows? So these nucleic acids, as I said, I don't know what I have protein up there for. I think the sneezing threw me off. Okay. Is a polymer just like the carbohydrates can be polymers, proteins are polymers. So that means we're basically sticking little units together again to make a chain of something. So in this case, the monomer, we call nucleotides. And so we can say that these nucleic acids are these long polymers with linked nucleotides. And by long, we do mean long. You know, for proteins, uh, we're talking, you know, uh, a few hundred up to a thousand amino acids is a pretty big protein. DNA chromosomes, we're talking billions of base pairs, right? So our genome, a billion base pairs plus, somewhere there, three billion. So that's a lot of polymer. And so that's really kind of key. It's very much a polymer chemistry sort of thing that we're dealing with. So in talking about these, there are differences between the two. Of course, looking at their name, I'm going to spit my halls out here. Deoxy, ribonucleic acid, meaning DNA, and ribo nucleic acid being RNA has to do with basically the addition of a hydroxide group. So in this case, our deoxy is missing just the hydroxide group compared to a ribonucleic acid. And that's really the difference between those nucleotides. So they're very, very um, similar and probably came about through divergent evolution. Both of these guys participate in all sorts of things. <clears throat> so both RNA and DNA participate in expression. That is the giving us of proteins, DNA being transcribed into mRNA, being translated into protein. And also in this process called DNA replication. So in expression, we're actually reading the sequence From that getting a protein, whereas replication is just specifically making new strands. So there is this big difference between the two. But we're going to have to talk about them both slightly. I'm sure you've heard them, or heard about them ad nauseum probably since about 10th grade. But we're going to go through just to make sure you understand what's going on. <coughs> 
So as I said, we can see that this is pretty conserved throughout evolution because when we take a look at these things, we find them pretty much everywhere. And their processes are pretty much everywhere. So anytime we talk about them being conserved, we're talking about through time. So we can see specifically that prokaryotes and viruses basically have these same processes that yeast and insects do, same as plants, animals, mammals, whatever. And so this conserved nature means we see the same process or the same molecule kind of throughout all of the various domains. So as a matter of fact, pretty much all of our DNA expression and replication machinery came from viruses and bacteria. They figured it out first and then passed it on to all the other levels. So we can think of life being compounded. So we start with these very simple processes and we compound them and kind of mix them together as we go higher up on the evolutionary scale, if you will. So all of the nucleic acids kind of have the same basic structure when we're dealing with polymers. Most polymers have these same basic structures as monomers. Amino acids all have the same basic structure, so do our nucleotides. Now recognize, and I know I do it, and a lot of people, scientists do it all the time, there are various names for the actual bases, the A's, T's, C's, and G's, and then there's the name for the base when it's hooked up to a nucleotide. So recognize that all of these nucleotides have a ribose backbone, so a five carbon backbone, hence ribonucleic acid. If we count these, carbons, we can once again, just like we did when we described the sugars, name these carbons, carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5. We also designate those as primes. Sometimes we call them 1 prime, 2 prime, Etc. Etc. So we can also call this five prime, three prime. It's just talking about the carbon, if you will. So that's our ribose backbone for oops, deoxy. So here's the DNA nucleotide. We call this an NTP, nucleotide triphosphate, eventually. <clears throat> then we have our ribose that is oxygenated. It's just the difference of that two prime hydroxide. With RNA, we have this two prime hydroxide. With DNA, we lost that oxygen, we deoxy. Same thing, we have the same number of molecules one, two, three, four, and five. Nice five carbon sugars. So, with that, when we describe these bases, that we have there on the one carbon sugar. These are your A's, T's, C's, and G's. And they're highly nitrogenous, tons of nitrogen. So if we take a look at these bases, these can be your A's, T's, C's, and G's. This is the sequence of our DNA, of course. It wasn't up until the 60s that we actually recognized DNA was a genetic material. We didn't think there were enough variables. We thought maybe it was protein after a while. So these nitrogenous bases can be either purines or pyrimidines, and they're what give us the actual uh, sequential info. So our purines 
to be adenine and guanine. And then our pyrimidines can be cytosine, thymine, and uracil, depending on whether your DNA or RNA. Now I could go and draw the big uh, compounds, these nitrogenous bases. So purines basically have two cyclic rings. Let me go ahead and give this to you. Um, just so you see it, I don't necessarily expect you to know it. such. So we have nitrogen double bonded here, nitrogen here, nitrogen here, here, and the free amine up at the top. This would be a purine. We have these two cyclic rings, if you will. Our pyrimidines are a single cyclic ring. such. So you can see if we start to draw all of this out, it just starts to get big and complex. And so we just call them bases for short. So when the bases, we talk about the bases by themselves, adding guanine, cytosine, thymine, uracil. When they're attached to the nucleotide, they take on a completely different name. So it would be Adenosine for adenine, guanosine, thymidine, uh, uridine, and cytosine. But you'll hear me use them interchangeably. So if I'm talking about it in sequence and I say adenine or guanine, but it's actually a nucleotide, it should be adenosine or guanosine. Recognize I just kind of flip back and forth, but we're talking about the same thing. So our DNA, of course, uses A, T, C, G. Our RNAs replace the Ts with a U. A, U, C, G. And so that's really the difference. So let's talk about polymer formation here very quickly and then we'll move on. So uh, we can talk about these as having directionality again. And I'm just going to show you this so you can understand the directionality. So a lot of times, we are guys in science and we think very linearly, linearly and in cartoon fashion. And so a lot of times you'll see us draw double-stranded helices as such, right? Nice, linear. But in reality, of course, that's not really what it looks like. So when we talk, take a look at these interactions going on, just so you can see what's happening here. I'm just going to make a bond between the phosphates, because usually what we have are triphosphate nucleotides. So we would end up on this side. Let's actually do it correctly so you can see. And we call these phosphates PI3, but recognize phosphates are PO4 with a negative 2 charge. So rather than drawing out all of these phosphate groups, I'm just suggesting that these phosphate groups are here. We have our three prime hydroxy. So here's our two, three, four, five. 
as we put these guys together, it's basically a three prime, five prime interaction. So the next nucleotide that's sitting there next to it, this base, hydroxy, we have our phosphate groups. As such, with all the oxygens attached, right? We basically end up cleaving this bond, and we get this interaction between the two. And so what we end up with was a very straightforward oxygen phosphate carbon oxygen bond. So I'm going to just draw this bond that's formed here. As such, and so we basically just start adding polymer to polymer. So the next base is going to get added here, and then the next one's down below it. So when we start to make these big polymers, this would be a single chain of DNA. We would call this single-stranded DNA chain. We can see that this process of making the polymer happens at this five prime going towards this three prime direction. So we can say making these strands replication is a five prime to three prime process. What does that mean? It just means that we have these five carbons and three carbons interacting to give us these bonds in between. So that means that we always have this linearity to it. This side is always going to have a free five prime phosphate groups. And this side is always going to have a free three prime hydroxide. So if I go back to my white male linear fashion of drawing things, I can draw one strand with having a five prime end, one strand having a three prime end. So this is how we talk about the directionality of a DNA strand. And all it means is that one side of the DNA strand has this free five prime phosphate, the other side has this free three prime hydroxide. So it's just a way of orienting this whole process. So here's basically how we start to make our, our, uh, our polymer chains. And then of course, once we make these chains, they form into a double-stranded helices. So basically our double-stranded DNA, we say it's complementary. And it's inverse, so it's inverse complementary. So that means A's, or adenines, hydrogen bond with T's, cytosines, hydrogen bond with G's. So we're always drawing these as A, T, C, G, G, C, T, and A, etc., etc. We don't show the hydrogen bonds in our little linear fashion, but they're there. And because we start to get this in the hydrogen bonds in the biochemistry, this thing very quickly becomes a helices. Basically what we call our double-stranded helices. So this double-stranded helix, we can say, has in, uh, intrinsic secondary structure as well. That it looks a certain way. So we can say it has a center access with a right-handed helix. Got that sugar phosphate backbone. Basically, it allows the bases be on the inside 
of the helix. And then there's a very common spacing between the nucleotides, so we get both a major and minor groove. Of course, I can't show it very well on the board. At the beginning of the next uh, lecture, we'll have a whole PowerPoint so that we can see all these nice secondary structures. But just kind of a basic lowdown about DNA, how we form a single polymer, that process of getting both of them together. We get this inverse complementary strand held together by hydrogen bonds. So that basically means all of the attributes of your double-stranded DNA have to do with hydrogen bonds. So because Gs have three hydrogen bonds with Cs, the melting temperature or the denaturation temperature is a different way of saying it. Melting slash denature temp is dependent on that guanine to cytosine ratio. The more GCs you have, the more hydrogen bonds, the stronger those two stick together. The fewer GCs you have, the weaker the hydrogen bonds, and it's easier to pull those two pieces together, or apart, I should say. So it's not the only type of helix we see. There are multiple types of DNA helices, believe it or not. So the one we've just described, we call a B-DNA helix. That's basically the one you find in nature. It's got that right-handed attribute. GCs, A's, T's. And it's the only physiologically active form we know about. So we know that the genes are being read, proteins are being expressed, all of that. But then there is kind of a few different lab variations. One we call ADNA. And this is kind of a dehydrated version, and it's kind of squat and scrushed down a little bit. So it's, again, right-handed, but we lose a lot of the major and minor groups that are in the DNA. Then there's this thing called a Z-DNA helix. It consists of a whole lot of CG repeats. And it kind of gives it this Z zigzag shape to the helix instead of a nice smooth curl. We know that this is a true biological DNA. but we really don't know what it's for. So we've never found it in nature, believe it or not. So then your question is, how do you know that it's a natural form of DNA? Well, even though we've never found ZDNA in nature, we know that viruses have ZDNA binding proteins. So we know that there must be something out there in nature where we see ZDNA. But in no most normal cells, we don't see any of that. Now, RNA is very similar, once again. It's just made out of the RNA nucleotides. 
rather than the deoxyribonucleotides. So A's, U's, C's, and G's. And it's structurally similar. However, there are some things that we know about it. Gloves. It is usually single-stranded. It does not form helices. It is usually linear but folds back upon itself to give it these secondary structures. Very rarely we do see double-stranded DNA. It's usually in brain tissue, the glutamate receptors in brain tissue. But most of the time, it's single-stranded, linear, Unless we're talking about a weird virus gene or something. Now, to date, all you've heard me talk about is mRNA, 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 but there are many different classes of RNA, and a lot of them have different functions. So, probably in the old days, if you took biology 10, 15 years ago, what you would hear is that there's a lot of junk DNA in our genome. And that's just not the case. Three point something billion years of evolution doesn't give you junk. It gives you just the appropriate amount you need, right? So with that, we have to talk about the classes of RNA and their function outside of just producing proteins. We're always kind of stuck on this production of proteins when in the RNA world, there's a whole lot more going on. So we have ribosomal RNA. And remember, it makes up part of the ribosome. This big complex structure of 30 plus proteins, five to seven pieces of RNA. This is the type of RNA. It's usually about 80% uh, of all the RNA you see inside the cell. We call it rRNA. Then, of course, you have messenger, which we call mRNA. These, of course, encode proteins and expression like we've been battling on about. Also, during expression, we have transfer RNA. And of course, we know these are the ones that transfer the amino acids into the ribosome and they act with the ribosome during the production of proteins. We call these tRNA. Then we have a whole bunch of RNAs that are regulatory. So we have small nuclear RNAs, also known as snRNAs. And that has to do with RNA splicing in animals. We have things like micro RNAs. Or silent RNAs. And we designate those with an MI or an SI RNA. And these guys are all about regulation. So they have the ability to turn different DNA genes on and off. So you can see there's a whole slew of different types of mRNA as well. Now recognize in biochemistry, we utilize the homologies of these things all the time. So what I can do is I can make something like an agarose electrophoresis gel. This thing is made out of kelp gelatin. 
purified kelp gelatin. We'll be doing these in lab one day. As such, and we can uh, basically separate DNA or RNA based on its electrophoretic flow. So we have a negative charged and a positive charged uh, anode and cathode. We run an electric, electrical current over this. So we could basically put in our DNA mixture and basically give it a current. Because DNA is negatively charged, it ends up migrating towards the path of the, the positively charged cathode. And it's kind of like a molecular sieve or molecular exclusion. So the smaller ones go quicker, uh, quickly through here because they're able to get through the pore space, uh, pore space faster. And then the larger chunks of DNA don't make it through that quite as fast. So let's say I have some DNA here. And what I can do is I can use uh, RNA as a probe. Let's say that on this band of DNA, I have the sequence three T's and three C's. I can make an RNA probe that has the homology to that, three A's and three G's. I can wash it over this gel, and what we get is binding of this probe. So it's one of the ways we can go in and fish for genes, look for genes. We know the sequence, we can kind of always use that homology. A's always bind with T's, C's always bind with G's, so on and so forth. So with that, we'll start with replication. We're not gonna go into it too heavily, we just wanna make sure we get the gist of how it happens. And then we'll kind of do the same thing with expression. I unfortunately had to take a whole semester class on each of these and metabolism. Horrible, horrible stuff. <laughs> okay. So replication, the first process we're going to deal with. This is important. This is how we make offspring. This is how one cell becomes many cells. So with DNA replication, recognize this is not a spontaneous process. Many different proteins are involved, and other factors as well. And we'll start with the fact that it has the kind of a semi-conservative nature. And that is, we call it semi-conservative replication. What that means is a template strand becomes part of the new DNA duplex. And so once again, we'll do this in nice linear form using these ladder-like representations. And so I have my strands of DNA. It's inverse complementary to one another. First thing that we see during this process is it denatures the parts of its individual strands. And during this semi-conservative replication, these are gonna serve as the template strands for new DNA synthesis. So in the end, each new DNA duplex has one parent strand or template and one new strand. If this were conservative replication, the parent strands would come back and associate with themselves only, and the new strands would only associate with themselves. But instead, 
that template strand becomes part of the new DNA helices. So here's a double stranded helis, here's a double stranded helis. And then when we go through subsequent rounds of, of replication, this same thing happens again. So in this case, they both become oh, template strands. I blew this comp out on me. And during the second round of replication, each one becomes part of the new DNA duplex. So you can see this is an exponential process. Two strands turn into four, which turn into eight, into 16, and you go from one DNA duplex to a billion in a short period of time. So that's what we mean by semi-conservative, that part of the DNA duplex has a template strand associated. Now, it happens in a linear fashion, like we showed with the actual chemistry. If I have my three prime and my five prime template strand, new synthesis happens in a five prime to three prime direction. So it's not gonna happen this way. By five prime to three prime, we mean the new strand, not the template strand. So what we would find is replication starts here at the five prime end, and it moves in this direction. In that five prime to three prime direction. Everyone okay with that so far? So this next thing I put up on the board, you don't have to draw, but I'm going to put it up there just for kind of shit's and giggles sake, for the point. So when we talk about DNA replication or DNA synthesis, it starts at a specific sequence called the origin of replication. And for a prokaryote, they only have one of them. They have such a small chromosome, the whole chromosome replicates at once. But we have big, long chromosomes with many origins of replication. We call these ori. And replication starts at what we call this replication fork. And like I said, this just doesn't happen naturally. DNA likes to zip up and be double-stranded. It doesn't like to be denatured and single-stranded. So what you see is a few different things happen. I'm going to run through this in kind of a stepwise, sequential fashion. An enzyme called DNA gyrase comes in and unwinds the DNA at the origin of replication. It recognizes the sequence, it's a specific sequence, it's specific for each organism. So E. coli has its own origin of replication and it won't work in us. And we have our own types of origin of replication, a specific sequence, and it won't work in other animals. So that's the first thing that comes in. Second thing we see is because this thing wants to zip back up, these other proteins come in to kind of structurally get in the way. We call these single-stranded DNA binding proteins. And they just kind of come in and bind right there at the origin of replication. And they hold the strands apart. They say, okay, you're not going to zip back up as long as we're here. Now if we give these things directions, so this will be a five prime side there, 
three prime psi here, five prime psi there, because remember it's inverse complement. The second or third thing that we see is we get a DNA <laughs> dependent RNA polymerase lays down RNA primers. And we'll talk about why this happens. We'll make those primers blue. So for the three prime side, it's pretty straightforward because it's inverse complement and we're going in this direction. It only lays down one RNA primer. We call this the leading strand. However, we have this kind of juxtaposition on the other strand. I can't go five prime, five prime, because then I'm not complementary to my template strand. Isn't that weird? So I just can't start at the end and replicate like I do on the leading strand. On this side, because we have this directionality, it's called the lagging strand, we have to do it in chunks. So we do five prime to three prime chunk here, five prime to three prime chunk here, a nothing, a nothing, a nothing. These are also RNA primers. Then we get DNA dependent DNA polymerase replicating the DNA in a five prime to three prime direction. So now our DNA polymerase comes in, it recognizes this primer, and one quick go, replicates that leading strand, no problems. But with the other side, because it's a five prime, three prime direction, it can't do it like that. So it goes piecemeal, chunk by chunk, and fills in the pieces between the primers. So why does it need these RNA primers? Well, DNA polymerase needs that three prime, or excuse me, a free three prime hydroxy. And because there's no like hydroxy to cling to here, it has to like throw in an RNA. RNA polymerase doesn't care, it can just throw RNA wherever it wants. Then, we're not done yet. Remove the primers and fill in the gaps. So my question is, way back when in the primordial ooze, when DNA was just starting to form, however it was just starting to form, it couldn't replicate itself. It needs all of these other proteins to replicate itself. So it's kind of like a chicken and the egg. Did it express proteins before it learned to replicate? Or did it learn to replicate before it expressed proteins? Pretty crazy, huh? Well, we thought about it, thought about it, and thought about it, and we realized that there's no way that DNA could be the genetic material of the first cells. Those very first living cells probably had an RNA genome to begin with. This developed into a DNA genome down the road. Why do we say that? Because RNA can act like a protein and a nucleic acid at the same time. So it can act like a genome and contain the genetic material, but it can also act like an enzyme and cut stuff. It can cut itself, it can replicate itself. Isn't that crazy? But for some reason, and it's more um, um, tenacious in atmospheres with lots of cosmic radiation, heat, all of that stuff. So it must have been way down the road that this huge developmental system where we have all these proteins 
carry out all these weird interactions before we got this DNA replication. Last couple things we'll end on is during this replication, this is when we see most of the major changes to DNA taking place. And we see them in a couple of different ways. We see mutation, and we see recombination taking place. For recombination, between a single chromosome, or within a single chromosome, or be between different chromosomes, depending on the organism. Of course, if it's a prokaryote, we only have one chromosome. So we can see recombination in a couple of different ways. Homologous recombination. That just means this is between similar sequences. So basically, I like to show this as two different colors. Each one is representing its own uh, double helix. Okay, so each strand is like a double helix. And I'm just going to put in some arbitrary numbers or letters so we can see this process taking place because we have the same sequence. On the other strand, when we get this crossing over, as you see here, well, let's just do a single crossover. Between the A, B, C, and G, what we would end up with the following. We would get this interchange between the two. The 80s would switch places. See the difference in the colors? But it's still the same sequence. So at the end here, we get no change. And in the end, we have a normal gene and a normal protein coming off of that. So this would be called a single crossover event. And then I could have a double crossover event where it happens more than once. And in this case, all it does, sequence is the same, but it just changes. And in this case, we would call this a double crossover. Same thing, we still get the same sequence, same normal gene, same normal protein. But we can also get recombination between heterologous sequences. And in that case, things turn bad. So once again, on the top we have our A, B, C, D. And in this case, we have a different sequence. And when we get a crossover event taking place, what we end up with is F, B, C, D, or A, B, D, C. So we get a change the gene and a change in the protein. So those are types of things that take place during recom or excuse me during replication. The other things, of course, are would be mutation, and there are a bunch of different types of mutation. We're not going to go through all of them, 
to list off a couple here, and then we're going to come back later down the road, later in the semester, and talk about these again. So we can have point mutations where we just get a change in a single base. Let's say an A converts over to a G. That would be an example of a point mutation. We can have an insertion where basically a whole chunk of DNA drops into another chunk of DNA. Or the opposite, we rip DNA out. We can have duplications where we get multiple genes being produced of the same gene. And a lot of this all takes place during that replication time. So replication is very kind of critical to any given cell. And we'll leave it there for tonight. So we'll take about a 10 minute break, meet down at the lab at quarter after seven. Hopefully we can pull off our spore stain tonight.